Good morning, Living Hope. Those of you who aren't deer hunters, it's good to see you. <laughs> Those of you who are deer hunters, watch online. Uh, now, it's good to be with you guys this morning. Happy to be digging into God's Word together. I believe this is week nine and possibly our last week in the Forward series. Yep, Dusky gave me the thumbs up. So last week on the Forward series, uh, where we've been trying to talk through some really basic aspects of spiritual life together in this series, and specifically how to get through them in such a weird and disconnected year. So our topic for this morning is forward through unanswered prayer. Uh, A few weeks ago, Mike's message was forward into prayer, and when we uh, originally decided on the order of this series, I remember sitting in the conference room thinking, uh, I think maybe unanswered prayer should follow prayer, like they should probably be back to back. But honestly, I'm a really gifted procrastinator, and leaving the order as it was bought me a few extra weeks before I had to get up here, so I kept my mouth shut. And Mike's talk on prayer was great. Uh, He unpacked the Lord's Prayer and used it to encourage us to have a rich personal prayer life. Super good stuff. Then last week, Chris's preach was forward through disappointment. And I was reminded that God is sovereign even when I'm lazy. Uh, What Chris spoke on last week was such a great setup for what I had on my heart for today. Um, Chris talked us through how to lean on God's faithfulness even when life is hard, uh, when things aren't going well, and even when they're just flat out heartbreaking. Uh, And then when we think about unanswered prayer, often what we're dealing with is disappointment with God. So if you missed Chris or Mike's preaches, I encourage you to listen to them or watch them online. They're both great. Um, I'm glad I kept my mouth shut in that conference room meeting, and I hope these messages connect for well as you guys as they have for me. Um, I'm just going to pray, and then we'll jump in. God, I just thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you always meet with us. Just thank you for your goodness, God. I pray that you reveal more of that goodness, more of that faithfulness to us this morning as we look at your word, as we reflect on how we communicate with you, how you communicate with us. God, just speak to us, speak loudly and clearly, and just let your presence be made known this morning. Amen. So like I said this morning, our topic is forward through unanswered prayer. And since this is a like a topical style series. I won't be talking out of one big part of the Bible this morning. If you're the kind of person that likes to open their Bible and follow along, sorry. Uh, I'm going to jump around a lot. I'm going to paraphrase some Bible stories, uh, but verses will come up for you to follow along with, and I hope it's not an overload of information for you. Um, so the type of prayer we're talking about this morning is mostly petitioning. Um, it's the give us this day our daily bread type of prayer to God. It's that part of the Lord's Prayer. We're talking about uh, giving, going to God with a request and waiting on an answer. Um, and just a reminder, this should not be our only type of prayer. If you have any normal friend and all you ever do is ask them for stuff, that's not going to be a healthy relationship. Uh, while God does have more grace for us than we have for each other, our relationship with him should be more than asking for stuff. Um, we should be praising and thanking and even just talking to God on a daily basis. Just again, go back and listen to Mike's preach, Forward Through Prayer. I love having all our services on YouTube because I don't have Facebook and I don't listen to podcasts. So otherwise, I never am reminded of our services. I never think to go back and listen to stuff. But I watch a lot of YouTube. So being subscribed to our channel helps it pop up for me. It's a good reminder. So Get on YouTube, get on whatever you have, and listen back through preaches. It's a good time. I'm going to start this morning with a massive spoiler about unanswered prayer. I don't believe in unanswered prayer. Um, Really, I don't believe that God ignores us. I believe that most of the problem is on our end. When we talk about unanswered prayer, we're really talking about either frustration with what God is doing or disappointment with what God is not doing. So what we're actually talking about is our will versus God's will. We're talking about God's sovereign perspective versus our limited perspective. I believe that God 
actually does answer all of our prayers. We might not hear or understand his answer, or he might not answer how we expected him to, or even how we wanted him to, but he does answer us. Our human lifespan might even limit how we perceive God's answers. We might not see it, but I believe he will answer. There are countless promises in the Bible that tell us that God wants to hear from us, and he also promises to answer. Let's look at a few from the New Testament. Starting in Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, burn, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. So in this, in these verses, God is promising to be our Father who has good things for us. There is this implication in these verses that we are asking for at least somewhat reasonable things. We need to be good stewards of the gifts God gives us. There are people who would use verses like these to as something to hold over God's head and try to get anything they can think of. Um, out of God, just trying to get what they want from God. But uh, look at what the son is asking for in this, in this scenario. It's bread and fish. It's daily sustenance. It's a normal, reasonable request to bring to God. I'm not saying that we have to pray perfect prayers by any means, but we should be mindful of what we're asking for God. And then he, prov- he promises to provide for us what we need. John 14, 13 and 14, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Similarly, just a little later, John fifteen seven, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus is wanting us to get on track with his heart in both of these passages. He's wanting us to understand that the work God is doing around us is bigger than us. It's about God's glory. The things that we pray should be about God's glory. It's similar to Paul telling us in Romans 12, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A great way for us to hear encouraging things from God is to be on track with with what he's already doing. Uh, That means, that's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. And we learn how to do this by spending time with him. That's what abiding means. It's time spent. Um, It's the simple things like praying and reading our Bibles. If our hearts are full of God's word, because it's what we're doing with our time, and we're abiding in his spirit, then the things that we pray will begin to shift shift away from ourselves and towards what God is doing around us. One more for us, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but by everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So just again, God wants to hear from us. He wants him to ask for stuff. He wants us to ask him for stuff. He wants us to bring him whatever is on our hearts. And no matter the outcome or the answer, we can find peace in giving our requests to God. So assuming kind of that premise, my big spoiler for now, that God does answer our prayers What kind of answers can we expect from God? How does God answer our prayers? We need to realize something, and this is an idea that I want to stress this morning. God does not have to say yes to us. I feel like most of the time I hear praise reports, if you're in a community group, or hear people saying, thank God for answered prayer. What they're actually usually saying is, thank God for saying yes. Thank God for giving me what I ask for. But we need to be more careful with our expectations of God. He is capable of other responses that still count as answering prayer. 
Not only should we not always expect God to say yes, we need to understand that it is not a bad thing when God gives us a different answer. So I grew up a Christian in a Christian home. I've had lots of Sunday school. I was lucky enough to go to St. Joe Christian for my entire schooling. So I've had lots of basic lessons on prayer. And really, uh, I remember these, and as I think back through them, most of them hold up. Um, I've never encountered a biblical problem with some of these things I learned as a young man or as a kid. So way back as a kid, I can remember being taught three answers that we can expect from God when we pray. And they are yes, wait, or not right now, and no. For the most part, these are the answers that we would expect from any normal interaction. Uh, The only difference between getting an answer from another person and getting an answer from God uh, is that people have to add in, I don't know, when we talk to each other, because we're not God. Uh, We don't know everything. The only time I can think in the Bible of Jesus kind of giving us an I don't know was in regard to his second coming when he says that only the Father knows that information. And even that's not actually about Jesus not knowing some piece of information, but it's about Jesus being our example of submitting unknown things to the Father. Even Jesus, as one of the three persons of God, is submitted to his Father and is demonstrating to us how to leave the Father's timing to the Father and let him be in control. But no, I wouldn't expect to hear, I don't know, from God the Father. So the first response we can expect from God is yes. Pretty much any time we ask God for something, we want him to say yes. This is the easy one to explain. No one needs to be reminded of how good it feels for God to say yes to us. And even better if it happens quickly, because we are such a society of give me now people. So we all understand that. If we, in all of our great wisdom, think that something is worth taking it to God, we usually think it's worth something worth saying yes to. And a lot of times they are. And a lot of times God says yes, and it's awesome. But even the yeses don't always come the way we expect them to. The most ex- historical am- uh, example of this is Jesus. In the Old Testament, God's people, the nation of Israel, had many, many terrible kings and spent many, many years in slavery to other nations. God had promised a Messiah or a Savior through the prophets to come and rescue his people once and for all. So while in bondage to the Roman Empire, they prayed for the coming of this Savior. But while they prayed for this Old Testament Messiah, they envisioned him a certain way. They were looking for a mighty warrior king to come and physically overthrow their current captors, which is the Roman Empire, specifically to their region, King Herod. But God's answer was Jesus, a poor kid from a poor family who came as a teacher and a servant. And he did overthrow the true captors of Israel, but it wasn't by storming Herod's palace and setting himself in place as king. God said yes to Israel's freedom and to all of our freedom, from the captivity of sin and death through Jesus giving his life in our place on the cross. He did set us free from this world, but not in the way we thought. When God says, wait, or when God says, not right now, we can get really antsy. We're not good at waiting. I've never heard anyone claim the spiritual gift of waiting. I'm so good at waiting. Thank you, God, for making me a good waiter. That's not a thing. If it's your thing, great. I've never met you. Um, But the Bible is full of waiting. There are so many stories where God speaks some huge revelation, some great thing is coming, and then the people wait. And they usually do really stupid things out of impatience while they wait. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, God goes to Abraham nomadic guy hanging out with his family, and he promises Abraham that he's going to make his family a great nation. At this point, the dude has no kids, and he's old 
like probably in his 80s. But God promises him a son. And then something like 15 years go by until finally in Genesis 21, his son Isaac is born. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, got impatient in those years, and they did some really stupid stuff out of that impatience. But God came through, and he gave them the son that he had promised. But they had to wait a really long time. 1 Samuel 16, David was the runt of his father's house, the youngest of eight boys. He got sent out in the field to hang out with the sheep all day, every day. One day the prophet Samuel shows up at his house. Samuel has David called out in front of his uh, dad and all eight of his brothers and actually says the elders of the city were there. And Samuel anoints David as the next king over Israel. Verse 13 is great. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. He didn't take David with him. David just had the best moment of his life and then got sent back out to the sheep. Hey, you're going to be king. Go wait with the sheep. And he had to wait for years while the crappy current king sat in the throne that David had been promised. And he eventually had to wait at that crappy king's feet as a servant to him and play him music. And he had to wait when that crappy king started chasing him down, trying to kill him out of jealousy. And for the most part, David did a surprisingly good job waiting. He wasn't perfect. He made some mistakes in there, but we got some really excellent psalms out of that time in his life. Let's talk about when God says no. It's fun. Why does God say no to us? If we go back to our Matthew 7 verses... We've already you know, laid the groundwork that God is our Father who has good things for us. Which must mean that even when God says no, it's for our good. It's because He has something better for us than what we're asking. God puts us in, the picture, in this picture as the kids because we understand the relationship between kids and parents. We understand saying no to our kids especially when they're little. My kids are little. I tell them no all day. Uh, We tell them no to crawling out the front door because we know that they, if they survive the fall down the front steps, they won't stop and they'll crawl out into the street. We tell them no because we know better than they do and we want them to stay alive. The truth is we are all at best careless little toddlers compared to our all-knowing loving father. Let's look at a story in the Bible. Um, 1 Kings 18 is a story about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. This is a great story. It's a famous story about God's victory over false gods. I'm just going to summarize it because what I actually want to talk about is the, the far less famous part of that story that happens afterwards. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, God's people have yet another terrible king. They have Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and they are horrible people. Uh, They hate God. They're actually made out to be some of the worst rulers in Israel's history. Um, And they have filled Israel with the worship of pagan gods, specifically Baal. Elijah is the prophet at this time. He's the primary person through whom God is speaking to his people. Ahab and Jezebel hate Elijah, because he prophesied a drought in their kingdom, and it hasn't rained in three years. Crops are dead, animals are dying, people are hungry because there's no water. God had been using this drought actually just as his intro into showing his authority over the land and the nation and the other gods that they had brought into his nation. And during this three years, Elijah's been in hiding because they want to kill him. So when Elijah finally shows back up, He calls for a big show, and he tells Ahab to bring all of his 450 prophets, and he challenges them. The prophets of Baal get an altar and a bull, and Elijah gets an altar and a bull, and they're both going to make an offering, each to their respective gods. 
But the challenge is no one gets to bring their own fire. Ahab's 450 prophets are going to pray to Baal, and Elijah is going to pray to his God. And whoever's God can send down the fire to their own altar will be named the one true God. Everybody agrees to the terms. The people all love it. It's a big show. Elijah, graciously and showing off, tells the prophets of Baal to go first. And all day they pray, and they scream, and they cry out, and they shout, and they dance, and they cut themselves. And they make a big, worthless show, but no answer. No fire. Then it's Elijah's turn, and Elijah has big faith, if you can't tell by now. He not only prepares the bull on his altar, he actually builds the altar by hand and prepares the bull on it. And then he digs a trench around it. And then he has water poured on it four times until the trench becomes a moat. And then Elijah prays a simple prayer. He just asks God to reveal himself to his people once again. And God sends the fire. And the Bible says that it consumed the burnt offerings and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So God has this huge victory. A short time later, God sends rain as a sign of God bringing healing to his people, healing to the land. He's demonstrated his power. He's revealed himself to his people once again. God said yes to Elijah's simple prayer in that moment in front of everyone. And that's what we want, right? God to say yes, clean and clear. Love that story. Great story. But the next time Elijah prays, he prays very differently. And God answers very differently. In chapter 19, Ahab goes back to the palace and tells his horrible wife Jezebel this grandiose story of all that Elijah's God has done. So Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah, just says, I'm going to kill you. Even after witnessing God's full power on display, Elijah gets scared and runs for his life. And he hides under a tree and he prays. First Kings 19.4, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. He actually asks God to kill him. At the end of the day, Elijah is still just a weak, scared little kid, and he gives up. Luckily, this is our example of God saying no. God sends a messenger, that actually says an angel, to tell Elijah to get up and eat. Sometimes even the strongest of us pray childish little prayers. Elijah just wanted to be done, but God had the grace to say no to that prayer by telling him something better, because he had something better for Elijah than giving up. One of the next great things Elijah went on to do was shortly after this, he meets Elisha, who God tells him to train as the next prophet, as his replacement. So God had more for Elijah to do. He had to pass on what God had given him. And ironically, God really said no to that prayer because Elijah's the prophet who never actually died. God took him up in a fiery chariot whirlwind. So that's cool. But <clears throat> God has said no to me many times, and I'm very, very grateful for those no's, but only because I can see now how much better his plan was than mine. And I'm thinking about a particular period of my life, um, specifically where, no, where God said no a lot. Looking back on these short-sighted, impatient prayers that I prayed, because all I could see was right in front of me, I am so glad that God said no to me. Um, my, short, my short-sighted prayers were not the same as Elijah's. I've never asked God to just let me die or to kill me. Um, but most of my short-sighted prayers, especially in this season I'm thinking about, were about girls. Um, specifically girls I liked. Um, as a guy who grew up a Christian, I always tried to talk to God about the girls I liked, but I wasn't 
mature enough to have made good decisions on my own. Um, so the first thing God did in his infinite wisdom to take care of me was that he made me painfully socially awkward. So immediately the prospect of dating around was out the window. It's not really ever something I wanted. Talking to girls was hard enough. I didn't really want to play the dating game. I just wanted to find the right one. So from my mid to late teens on, every crush was to some degree a wife hunt. And I know it sounds creepy, <laughs> but it's actually a really common thing that Christian guys deal with. I've met other guys that had the same kind of struggle. Uh, we had a club back in the day. Um, I was president. That's a joke, but not really. Uh, every time I had a crush, I would pray that she would like me back. And most of those prayers actually just felt unanswered. God didn't come and audibly say no to every girl I prayed about. Um, either I would never actually tell her how I felt because of the socially awkward part, or things just wouldn't go beyond friendship. But each time I would feel disappointed and discouraged and like I wasn't worth enough. But in reality, God knew my heart better than I did. While I may have been smart enough to pray about those crushes, had God said yes to them when I was that young and stupid, those relationships would have led to some major mistakes because I lacked the maturity and self-control to be in that kind of relationship. That is evidenced by the number of mistakes I made, even just involving female friendships. Uh, just because I never dated around before I met my wife doesn't mean I never messed up. But each time God says no to us, I believe he has something better planned than what we have planned. For example, my wife. Every day that I wake up next to her, I thank God for telling me no to every other girl who wouldn't have been as perfect for me as she is. And I thank God for making me awkward enough to have avoided the amount of mistakes that a more charming version of my younger self would have made. God said no to me because he had a better plan. I would not have my amazing family without God saying no to me. So if we have these three answers that God's going to give us, he's always going to answer us, yes, wait, or no. Why do we feel unheard? Why do we feel like God doesn't answer? I have a pretty short answer for this. And then I'd like to just remind us of a few ways to keep our hearts in check and safeguard us against frustration and disappointment with God. The primary reason that we struggle to, under, to hear or understand God's answer is perspective. We are so small and we are so impatient. We can only see a certain distance in front of us and it frustrates the living crap out of us. But the good news is, is that God is so big. He has such good things for us all the time. Our Father sees the whole picture, not just your whole picture or my whole picture or the whole picture of the Bible, but all of it, all at once. And he has plans for us that are based on his view, on his perspective, not ours. Uh, one more verse for us, and it's a promise that we can claim and recite to ourselves. Romans eight twenty eight. And we know that for, the, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So if you love God, he is working for your good, and he has plans for your life. It's that simple. So I'd like to wrap up by just reminding us of some really practical ways to help our hearts be patient and to listen to what God is saying to us, because it is hard and we need help. The band can come on up. This won't take long. Here are three practical ways that uh, we know God will speak to us. Number one, he's going to speak directly to us. We have access through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit to hear directly from God. And he'll answer us in a couple of ways. He can use his audible voice. This seems to be pretty rare but it can happen. Uh, it's in the Bible that it happens, and I know people that have heard it. Um, I would say I've come close to hearing the audible voice of God. He spoke that strongly to me, but um, it's far more common that God will just speak to our hearts. We sometimes call this our conscience or that still, small voice. 
It's that voice in your head that sounds like you, only way more reasonable and way more wise than you normally are. The second major way God is going to speak to us is through the Bible. That's why we call it God's Word. The Bible is such a great gift from God, and He still speaks through it every time you open it. It is full of wisdom for just about every life situation, and it is how we get to know the heart of God, because it's His story. The third way that God will speak to us is through other people. We need other people in our lives. We need other Christians around us who love us, who can correct us and encourage us. I cannot tell you how often I have valued people in this church who have listened to my problems and encouraged me and prayed with me. And that's coming from a mega introvert. Seeking people out and opening up to them does not come naturally to me. It's not easy, uh, but there's so much value in it. My last note on this, if you're listening for God, but you're ignoring options two and three, you're just listening for that voice in your head, but you're not reading the Bible and talking to other people, then you'll lose the ability to tell the difference between the Holy Spirit's voice and your own. We have to weigh what we're hearing in our head by checking it against what the Bible says and by seeing what other people think about it. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope this hasn't felt like an oversimplification of a hard topic. I know that waiting on God is difficult. Not seeing what God is doing is difficult. But I think if we try to keep these stories from the Bible in mind, and if we ask for help when we need to, then we can learn to celebrate the no's and the not right now's with just as much joy as we celebrate the yes. Let's pray and we'll sing together. God, again, I just thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you love us and you answer us. I do pray that you give us patience to wait on you when we need to. God, help us to talk to other people more and get the help that we need so that we don't feel alone. God, just speak to us even as we worship this morning, as we sing to you, God. Let us hear your voice. If there's something on our minds we've been waiting on, let us grab somebody else while we're all together and ask for help, ask for prayer, talk about it. God, just teach us to love you more, to submit to you more, and to wait on you better. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. And just as we worship this morning in song, I just want to encourage you to um, just respond to what we've heard, um, the word that we've heard this morning. Um, those can be hard things, you know, those, the waiting and the no's. Be hard to do to wait well um, when we're waiting for for God's answers. Um, so anyway, I just want to um, encourage you to respond this morning. We'll have a prayer team, I believe, <laughs> back there, <laughs> sure, or find someone <laughs> and they can pray for you. <laughs> um, and if you feel like the Lord has put something on your heart this morning that's for everyone, we do want to encourage you to bring that up to Mike and Parker, and we'll see about working that in this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We do pray that you would just speak to us this morning, Lord, that we would um, take the words we've heard this morning to heart, Lord, that we would um, align ourselves with you, Jesus. That we would be willing to hear the answers that you give, Lord. We would put our trust fully in you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Be lifted
Let the heavens rejoice, let the nations be glad, let the whole earth tremble, for you are God. Come and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Yes, Lord. Let the
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Yes Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Yes, Jesus Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You're still enough to keep me within your love, and my heart will sing your praise again. Yes, Lord, your promise to hell stands. Great is your faith. in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence
that we can have confidence in you, Lord, confidence in your faithfulness, Father, in your goodness, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so kind With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God all my life And all my life you have been faithful So, so kind With every path that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Sing that verse again I love your voice And you have led me through the fire In darkness you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness All my life And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, Running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With 
Just as Tyler was was uh, speaking as he's preaching today, he did he shared the story from Genesis of, of Abraham. And actually, as soon as he started, uh, like right before he started, I just felt like God just highlighted that story to me. So I just want to take another look at it. I think there's just there's just something in here that's so incredibly helpful to us. And uh, in Genesis 12 is actually when God first comes to Abram and he says to him, "Hey." Uh, I'm going to make you into a great nation. He tells him that he's going to bless his offspring. And, and when he does this, Abraham is 75 years old. And he has no children. And his wife is similarly aged. And they're both, you know, way past the age of having children, basically. I mean, I'm, you know, in my 30s and I don't have enough energy for it. Uh, and, you know, it's crazy, though, because he gives him this promise. And, and, and this isn't just any promise. Like, this is how God is going to build, like, his people through Abraham. Like, this is going to be where all of the Jewish people come from. And this is the first, like, you know, one of the first fathers uh, of the Jewish faith. And, and the, the crazy thing about it is he comes to Abraham with his plan. It's God's plan. And then Abraham has to wait. And it turns out that by the time Isaac is born, the Bible tells us that Abraham is 100 years old, right? So by this time, I can just imagine when Abraham is 98 and he's thinking, God, you know, 23 years ago, you made this promise to me. I'm not getting any younger. In fact, you know, in 98 years old, I can't even imagine, right? And, and you made this promise. And what's incredible is I just think the, the thing about this story is it's just it's it's just marvelous we have the we have hindsight like Tyler even said you know you look back in your life and you see God's moving you see God his hand in your life you see things you thought were unanswered prayers you see, see things you thought were impossible that God somehow worked out and I just feel like God wants to encourage us with this story with this sermon today that 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 our minds we think on the scale of weeks we think on the scale of months we think on the scale of years Right? You have things you've been praying for, you've been desiring for your life. But, I, you know, I bet none of us are in the situation that Abraham is in, you know, where it's, it just seems impossible. His wife's 98, he's 98, God's promised him a baby. And, you know, but then it happens. And then not only does it happen, but everything that God says, it flows from this. That actually through this line, through that miracle, through that way, Jesus, you know, he's, he's connected to that family. We're connected to that family. And I just think that the big idea here is just, you know, we do, we do, we need to think and realize that God is moving even when we don't see it. And that, you know, a lot of times it, the, the thing God's telling us, he's saying, wait, he's saying I'm here. And I just feel like he wants to encourage us with that. Uh, yeah, just uh, to go with that, just James says you don't have because you don't ask. And I just feel it's time to plant like a picture of plant a seed and it takes time and time we're in the waiting game uh, and in all reality that is in, with Christian life we're in the waiting game of Christ returning in a sense even but just how I feel God is kind of saying like to plant you don't have because you don't ask but that waiting game is not a bad thing it's producing something in us and how God's going to draw us in as we're crying out to him it goes deeper, the burden goes deeper, the, the cry goes louder. 
And that's what God wants. He wants us to sharpen that, to, to sharpen our prayers like an arrow, to shoot it with, with accuracy, to just say, God, please wake me up, wake other people up. And how as we grow with our passion and praying, it's going to move him because it's going to move us. We have to first be moved in a sense. And I feel God is saying, don't neglect the time where you plant because the growth in that prayer of being answered or waiting or this or that, it's the growth in you he's concerned about. It's a discipleship where you learn to truly battle and say, God, move. And you'll see him in your own life because you'll be abiding in him and dwelling in his presence. And God just wants us to draw near. Oftentimes that's why we're in the waiting because if it gets answered, we just move right on. He wants us to draw near and it's gonna produce something in us. And I just wanna encourage you just like Abraham in Romans four, it says he didn't grow weary that it wasn't being answered. But as he prayed, his faith grew and grew and grew. Praise him, praise him. Praise him when you're in the waiting. Praise him when you're in the confusion. Praise him for the things he is, not for the things he's not doing. Praise him. God's going to do things in your life. Yes, 
trust in your goodness father we would trust in your perspective not ours Jesus we thank you Lord that you do work all things together for good Lord even when it doesn't look good right now Lord Jesus thank you Lord Lord I just pray that you would be glorified in our waiting that you would move in our hearts, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. We'll see you next week. <laughs>